I was, it's like you've never done a podcast before today, mate. <laughs> I just want to do this on purpose, since you guys say I'm always eating. Hi and welcome to the now awards nominated We Needy Roads podcast. I'm your host Neil and I just about survived the Independent Podcast Awards in foggy London town the other week where sadly we didn't win for best theme song but it was great to meet some Twitter people in real life and also get a nice midweek hangover because of the free bar. And also Jose and uh, Cassie, Shake Shack saved my life. We have about two of them in the UK and there is <laughs> one now at the train station back to where I live. So I was like, oh, and it was still open at getting on for midnight. So now let me introduce everyone, even though I've already done it twice there, badly already. So joining us <laughs> as always from sunny Portugal is Marie from the Two Girls One Reusable Cups podcast. We have Jose from sunny Florida and all the way, well, all the way from, well, I'm going to be honest, I know I don't really have an idea what the weather is like in, where are you from again, Cassie? Wisconsin. It's not great Wisconsin. right now. <laughs> uh, cold and cloudy. <laughs> you have, you have actually seasons in Florida, we yes. just get hot and not so hot. Correct. Yeah. You know, I would say our seasons are similar to like what they are in England. We have like warm summers, cold. We, we get more snow here, but you know, yeah, there's more variety than there is in Florida for sure. I mean, all I really know about Wisconsin is cheese is big there, right? And I you was have a lot of lakes. Say, I was going to say the exact same thing. <laughs> cheese yeah, and I mean, that's the stereotype. We're certainly not sitting around just eating cheese 24 7, but for some reason, <laughs> that is like what people associate with us so yeah you know uh cassie welcome to the podcast and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do thanks um yeah so uh what i do in real life or my happy life um <laughs> happy life. I... <laughs> <Something's positive. laughs> um yeah i'm i'm like a film uh critic and journalist that i've been doing that i i started uh doing it more seriously during like the lockdown era pandemic time so it's been a few years um I love doing talent interviews. I love, um, it, yeah, doing reviews. I just joined the Online Association of Female Film Critics this year, which is really exciting because I started getting screeners in my inbox for the first time. And that's without having to ask, you know, it's just like, oh, my gosh, it's like Christmas every day when I open my email. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, wow. I'm yeah, I just love meeting meeting people like you and just talking about movies i love talking about movies with people so so you're way more experienced than us <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I don't know. we aspire to we aspire to be in a position to get screeners but i mean like <laughs> we, we start me and my me and uh, my original co-host david we literally started this like everyone else did during covid just chatting about mm -hmm. movies and then uh yeah. uh we kept going <laughs> like a year or so later and then he got married child on the way and he's like can't really do the podcast as much mm -hmm. but bizarrely since then, I was like, Jose, I need, because uh, you used to comment on our articles, didn't you? He was like, so, yeah. Jose, come on the pod. And then uh, we had a friend, Ben. Our friend, Ben, came in as well. And uh, I've known Ben since we were 15. And we're way, way much older than that now. But his uh, day job, he wanted to be a rock star. Didn't really work out. But he then became a tour manager. So now he's literally in Australia on tour with punk bands. And that's his day job, which is pretty sweet. Also means we get free gig tickets when he's uh, around as well, which is very, very good. Nice perk, yeah. Nice perk, yeah. <laughs> and also, I did notice uh, every other tweet you post, uh, Cassie, is about Pedro Pascal. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Totally my tweet, my tw I'm so I'm constantly apologizing for my Twitter account. I just, I need, yeah, I need to, I need to reel it in, and I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you should just say it with your chest. I do, you know, as, as <laughs> to the point where you know I can't get fired because a lot of my coworkers um, <laughs> follow me on there too. <laughs> So I can't say everything that's on my mind. Ah. <laughs> I try and keep it PG-13. Um, but yeah, I'm a big Pedro so, fan. I, I got to ask, what, what what do you think is his best film right now? His best film? I just love him as a person. Don't ask me what his <laughs> best film is. <laughs> I watched The Last of Us and I was just a goner after that, quite frankly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I just love I him. I have to say, the, the one he did with Nicolas Cage, just that long title I never remember... The unbearable weight of massive talent. Oh, sure. yes, yeah. yes. I've only seen I love that. Of it, and honestly, 
I'd say take your time, but you definitely got to watch it eventually. It's it's a hilarious, oh, hilarious it's just film. a buddy film. It's they're so good together, yeah. the two of them. I loved it. Yeah, and it turned me on to Paddington surprisingly. So oh yeah, yeah right, because he says Paddington too. Yeah, third <laughs> yes. favorite film of all time or something like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I was like, that. okay, I got to yeah. check this out. You know, when a movie talks about another movie, you got to you got to look into right. it. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm taking my dad in a couple of weeks to see Gladiator 2 in IMAX, and he's never been to an IMAX film before. So, uh, oh. yeah, you know, you're going to get to see Pedro Pascal, what, 20 feet tall on the uh, oh. on the big cinema screen over here. So, yeah, nice. looking I mean, forward to that. He's probably definitely going to die. I don't know that for sure. But I think we all know. <laughs> like, <laughs> We were debating this when we saw the trailer. We were just like, I, yeah. He doesn't yeah. do well in arenas, like if we remember uh, Game of Thrones. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but then I feel like that's the obvious one to go for. I reckon he's gonna survive. I reckon you're gonna think he's gonna die then, and he might survive till near the end. Maybe I've heard he. I've heard he only has like ten to fifteen minutes total of screen time. So. Oh really? Wow. Yeah. Oh. oh well. <laughs> so then the trailer's definitely messing with us. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, the trailer makes it look like he's he's the, the star. Main one. <laughs> <laughs> he's not. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so moving on, uh, we're going to move into our what we've been watching section. So this is kind of just basically exactly what it is. What we've been watching recently, it can be TV, it can be film. Marie, what have you been watching recently that we are not going to be talking about in the show later? Uh, nothing. As what? Well. <laughs> <laughs> Which That's is what it. I thought you was going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, my life has been consumed by one show, but we're going to be talking about that, uh, that mm. not this episode, but the following one. So... <laughs> Consumed is the word. Going to our first time guest, uh, Cassie, what have you been watching recently? Um, a lot. So the exact opposite of Marie. <laughs> um, <laughs> I went to see Here in the theater yesterday with my friend, which we knew it was not going to be great going in. And man, what a roller coaster of emotions. Um, just phenomenally strange movie from start to finish. Just bonkers like some really weird uncanny valley green screen some just very questionable <laughs> scripting um but yeah. you know what like yeah i we were talking about it after he's another he's a, a critic um in chicago and you know we had to get it give it credit for i mean it's a really bold concept it's i don't know if you know about it but it's a, the robert zemeckis movie where it all mm -hmm. takes place in one it, one place it literally starts out Hanks? like the dinosaurs yes <laughs> oh it starts and with it, the dinosaurs literally what? yeah it wow. goes from like the comet hits hits the earth <laughs> and then it, it passes through all these different you know like native americans and then there's like benjamin franklin lives there a lot of really important <laughs> oh, people wow. in history lived in this house <laughs> which of course. You know, what are the odds, you know? I mean, <laughs> the guy who invented the Lazy Boy is a character. Why? I don't know. Why? It's. I'm telling you, it's just so strange. <laughs> um, but as weird as it is and as not great as, as it is, it's also very nihilistic and just very, very sad. So at the end, I'm just sobbing and but also laughing because it was bad. And my friend was like, are you crying because you're sad or crying because you're laughing so hard because it was bad. And I'm like, yes, all of those things, <laughs> <laughs> all of it. I mean, it's something, <laughs> it's an experience. I'll tell you. Yeah. Um, wow. It's an experience. I don't know. Get, get yourself, <laughs> make, make up your own mind. Um, so that was yesterday. And then um, <laughs> let's see. And then I finished uh, the second half of Frasier season two, the reboot, um, as I was uh, talking about before, uh, I love the, the original Frasier is like my favorite show of all time. I just it, it's very all special time. to me wow. <laughs> of all time. Yeah. I don't know if it's um, just a nostalgia or what. I just love the humor and and I just think it's a great show. So, you know, I, I was a little hesitant uh, going into the reboot and I thought season one was OK. And when they sent uh, the screeners to me for season two, there's there was like 10 episodes total and they just sent the first five to begin with. So when I reviewed it, I was like, God, this is, I, this is bad. <laughs> like, it's not good. Like this is really going downhill. And it broke my heart because I, you know, want to love it because it's Frasier and I love Frasier. Um, and then I finally got around to watching the second half over the last couple of days and it really finds its stride like Roz is now a regular recurring character again and just having Roz and Fraser together again just there's something there that was missing like earlier on um 
yeah, I, I feel like they're leaning into some of the things that that made the reboot uh, better and uh, relying less on some of the side characters that we kind of just, I didn't care about. I mean, <laughs> against them, but like, you know, you tune in for Frasier and for Roz and for that nostalgia, not necessarily the new characters that you like don't really, you're not watching for. Um, so yeah, I hope, I hope it gets picked up again. I mean, I'd like to see it get a season three. Um, so I've been watching Frasier and then that the awful, awful, awful Menendez brother show that I'm weirdly obsessed oh. with. Um, just because I love the the actor who plays Eric. I, he's like so cute and I love him so much, but the show's so bad, but I just, I can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> this is the uh, Ryan, Ryan Murphy one, isn't it? Monsters, the second yeah, series. It's, oh my God. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's so bad, but I, I can't look away. It's like a, it's like a car crash. I don't know. <laughs> And all the drama behind the scenes of like, it's just, I like don't need to go into it because there's a lot, I could talk about it for like five hours, but it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's been consuming a large portion of my brain for the last month or so. So what do you think made the change to have it not be as good as the previous installment? Probably just the fact they had to make a second series, I would say, after the first one was a success. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, so, I don't think Dahmer was that good either. Um, I, I thought Dahmer was okay. Um... I mean, David oh, was a big fan of Dharma. So mm. this, he, he took a lot of, I don't know if you'd want to say creative liberties. He insinuated a lot of things that were like kind of offensive to the brothers who are currently in jail. I mean, he insinuated that they had like an incestuous relationship with each other, which they're like, oh. no, we didn't. It's really. Um, and he didn't and interview love, like, let the me, brothers. I want to say no one loves no one loves gay guy stuff more than me. I'm a huge gay guy fan, but like <laughs> I love it. You're in good <laughs> well, wait, until we move on to it <laughs> to but, one of my shows. <laughs> that's like that said, it was like it's so like unnecessarily horny. <laughs> like this is a show <laughs> about two two guys who um you know, killed their parents because they were being like horrifically abused by them. And it just feels really just unnecessary at times. Mm. Um, that said, there is another very large part of me who just appreciates seeing like hot gay guys. So I, <laughs> you know, this is why I'm so torn <laughs> as a, as a journalist, as a critic, like, I'm like, I feel like I can't respect it um, mm. because it is okay. kind of problematic. Um, but there's another like, uh, part of me that kind of it's like it's like a hot fudge sundae with sprinkles in in tv form oh. or just like it's super overindulgent and like would this fall you know into I mean? guilty pleasure zone yeah sure sure very yeah. guilty <laughs> like i'm kind of like should i be talking about this right now um yeah so so there you go that's my very 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 long answer of what we've been watching awesome, awesome. <laughs> that is not even close to the longest one we've ever done here for oh, good. Okay. <laughs> we, we had one what we've been watching section once and went so long that was basically the podcast and we had to put move the main reviews to another one because we'd already yeah. been talking for about two and a half hours oh my uh, gosh <laughs> yeah. the format is loose it's very loose here yes. jose mm -hmm. what have you been watching recently so i've come to the realization i'm addicted to youtube and I, it's it's ironic. I watch. Are YouTube you full channels. I was about to say, does this count? I don't think this yeah. counts. <laughs> so I, it, trust me, it's going somewhere. Um, but Is I it? realized I watch a lot of channels that talk about upcoming movies. So it's kind of ironic that I don't watch as many movies as I should. But the mm -hmm. few things uh -huh. that I have watched, I've noticed Netflix has kind of gotten back into my rotation. But it's in a weird way where I don't finish some things. Uh, I'll try to watch something like there's this movie called Uglies. About a, it's you could tell oh. it's a, like a young adult ripoff. So the young adult dystopia, yeah, yeah, and it's like for some reason everyone becomes pretty at the at the age of like eighteen and they get surgeries and and I'm like I I tried watching it and I could see kind of where it was going but I just didn't care enough to finish. <laughs> And then uh, I watched a little bit of uh, Gundam Requiem for a Vengeance. It's a it's a oh based on the manga. Yeah. And the first episode was pretty solid, but it's just not my genre. But I just wanted to check it out just to have something else on my repertoire. Um, I could probably watch it like if I'm doing something else, but it's not really my thing. And then, you know, I, I, I really that's that kind of like the short list of it. I've, I kind of repeat a couple shows. I went back to Altered Carbon season two to kind of see what finish that it? was. I didn't finish it. I got a couple <laughs> episodes in. It's it's honestly not as good as the first season. The first season no, was no. just solid. Same. And then every once in a while, I'll go back to Brooklyn Nine-Nine. 
<laughs> you can't go wrong show. with Brooklyn Nine-Nine. <laughs> yeah. For me, it's Parks and Rec and Community. Yeah, they're the two. They're like, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. They are the, the my, they are my hot fudge Sunday uh, shows. There. there we go. Yeah. Now, uh, a show I've been watching that is a. Uh, I don't think anyone knows it. Like, it's on Amazon in the UK, and I don't know if anyone ever mentioned it. It's called The Devil's Hour, and it's a second series of it. It stars a British actress Jessica Rain and Peter Capaldi, so from Doctor Who. And season one, I think, was so badly mismarketed because it looked like a spooky kid horror show. You know, there's this spooky kid who's seeing ghosts and Peter Capaldi's a serial killer who's going, well, obviously killing people because he's a serial killer. <laughs> and uh, But instead of a detective after him, the main actress is a social worker. So you're like, okay, this is kind of weird. And she keeps waking up at 3.33 in the morning, which is the devil's hour because it's 6.66 the other way around. And so I was like, but it's not a horror show at all. The more you watch it and the clever it's put together... It's like this twisty, turny, almost Christopher Nolan-esque drama. The the reveal at the end of the first series, literally, it's kind of like the 1899 thing, Marie. It's kind of, it, it would have changed the genre of the show for the second series. Except here, we got the second series. And then we're actually doing the third series as well now. Because they actually, it's, it's just nice when a streamer commits to a series and they go, right, we've got an arc of three seasons. This is where it starts. This is where it ends. And the actress herself said in an interview, oh, well, I signed on because this is what the arc of the character was. And it was going to be great if we could play it all. Yeah, so like season two, though, is only sadly five episodes and maybe it's not as good as the first series because it's kind of like that usual suspects moment in the uh, end of the first season when all the bits drop together and like, wow, it's kind of what you're going to be talking about on uh, an upcoming one, Marie, where the plot, where all these like random lines and bits there and then you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why was that line said? And then you have to go back and watch it again because I watched it myself and kind of enjoyed it. Then I got to that big reveal. and I was like, this is amazing. And I was like, dad, dad, you're going to like this. And he's like, no, I don't know. I was like, trust me, stick with it, watch it. And he loved it. And so we've just binged all the season two in like in last week. But um, I don't really want to say anything more about the plot because it's really... But I will say, if you see the adverts on a Prime video for it, really give it a go. It's just, I think, the best thing the actress has done. She's kind of done like primetime British shows, Jessica Rain. She's not really done too much out there. I don't think she's done much in the States or many movies, but she's so good in the show. And of course, Peter Capaldi is Peter Capaldi. You know, he, he's always going to be good. One thing I have uh, also watched is I've finally caught up from the start on, uh, I think it's six episodes now of The Penguin. And holy shit, is it good? I mean, we all know it was going to be good, right? We knew Colin Farrell would be excellent because he was great in the, the uh, Matt Reeves Batman film. But the undoubted MVP of the whole show is uh, Kristen Miller is Sophia Falcone. I mean, she should be up for Best Actress at the Emmys immediately from this. She's so good. But we get a flashback episode, uh, a couple of episodes in, and you see her whole character arc from like the early days to right where she is now, which is great because it juxtaposes what's happened to her and is she this basic psychotic murderer that we all think she is, or isn't she? And the show kind of... I really just I really appreciate the slow burn character-based drama it is rather than it being this kind of superhero adjacent show which i think of a lot of people thought it was going to be i mean you can clearly see they were influenced by sopranos from it i even think some of the producers were involved with it back in the day um and if you're not a superhero fan it doesn't matter because mm-hmm. i think you could it uses the odd name or the odd location he's direct from batman law but you could absolutely watch it as this great standalone crime drama i honestly think this is one of the years best i think we've got two episodes left for this season. And so the only real question is, is there going to be a second season? Because, uh, and I'm yeah. sure we're going to be talking a full spoiler uh, bit on this once the last two episodes have aired as well. So I'd like to say I have been watching this and I'm not going to talk about it more except for one little tidbit. My brother-in-law and I watched it. Mm-hmm. And in the first episode, there's there's just a moment where he's doing stuff. And then he's like, you know what? Let me just watch the sunrise. And I was like, okay, that's weird, but okay. And then my brother-in-law was like, do penguins like watching sunrises? And he looked it up and <laughs> penguins like watching sunrises. No and I way. just thought that was the funniest little like lore adding to, mm. to that show. So they really do their research. And that's all I'm going to say about that. I got to give it up to my brother-in-law because he's the one that even caught that. I was like, what? That was so good. That was too good. And uh, so the most recent thing I've seen, which literally was the cinema the other night on Halloween, and it was a preview screening of the new Hugh Grant A24 horror film, oh, Heretic. Man. And it's from uh, Scott Beck and Brian Woods, who made the really, really disappointing Adam Driver versus Dinosaurs film, 65, in my opinion. Well, thankfully, they fully redeem themselves here. This is such a good film. I think it's one of the best horror films of the year. I, I, I think 
if there wasn't such like a stigma about horror, this would be up for like again. I know David says I say it all the time when I see a film <laughs> like, but this is an awards worthy film. Like Hugh Grant is so good in it. Uh, he plays the outwardly cheery Mr. Reed, who, as you see from the trailer, traps two young Mormon missionaries in his house and then makes them question their beliefs uh, in, about faith and basically about everything. And uh, I love Grant's kind of move now into creepy older character ta territory. Mm -hmm. You know, he did his years and years of rom-coms and then, you know, he had his uh, villain performance in Dungeons and Dragons the other year. I mean, he was basically just playing a Tory MP in that, which was, uh, <laughs> you know, he was literally just like, I'm going to be a, play a politician in that. And this one, I think what works really well in this one is that he's kind of playing. Well, okay, so I've got something I like to call the Bill Murray syndrome, right? In the 80s and 90s, Bill Murray, he gives you these great sarcastic deadpan comedy performances in pretty much everything he does. But then most of the last 20 years, I'd say from Lost in Translation onwards, and a lot of his uh, Wes Anderson work as well, he gives the exact same performance, but in a drama. And so mm -hmm. I think this like this generation of like young writers and directors have kind of grown up loving what Murray did and thought, but if we take that exact performance and put it in a drama, it's going to be like bittersweet. It's going to be tragic. And I don't re ever really think Murray's doing much different than what he's always done. It's just that the filmmakers have, have kind of viewed him in a certain way and go, okay, we want him to be in, we're going to portray him in this kind of way now. So as he's got older, he's not as funny as what he says. It's, you know, it's a bit sadder. It's a bit more tragic. And so, uh, and I think that's exactly what Hugh Grant's doing now. He's moving into this. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's basically playing 90s rom-com Hugh Grant in this. He's just a bit older, but he's still like cheery and, and that's what makes him more terrifying because it's you've taken 90s rom-com Hugh Grant and made him slightly creepy because he's older and he's locked in a house with two young girls. But he's still smiling and he's still really polite and you're just like, no, it's wrong. Get out of there. Get the hell out of there now. I, I was I say, that might work on me. I might be even more intrigued <laughs> by him acting like a total creep. <laughs> I'd say he also kind of had shades of this in the Gentleman movie in 2019 with Matthew McConaughey. Um, he played like a side character who wasn't really uh, good, but not bad either. Um, but so yeah, this really I feel like he's been doing a lot more for a little while now with uh, the, the the darker side of things. I mean, yeah, like you said, he did that. He did uh, Dungeons and Dragons. He's done this now. I just, I, you know, I think he did. There was a TV show he did with Nicole Kidman as well. Was it The Undoing? I was Undoing, just going to say, I was thinking about that. What was that show called? It was good, but I can't remember. But he was a creep in that one. <laughs> I, I wonder if he's even acting at this point. Because I remember, I um, well, actually, there, there's a story <laughs> that will tie into someone I'm reviewing later about Hugh Grant, which is kind of cool. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I must mention the young actresses in there. You've got Yellow Jacket Sophie Thatcher plays Sister Barnes. So she's kind of the more well-known one uh, and the actress out of the two. She was also in, um, was it Ahsoka as well, wasn't she? Which is one of the Star Wars shows. But relative newcomer Chloe East, who I've never seen in anything, and I, she's, I, I looked up her IMDb and she's done very little. Uh, she plays Sister Paxson and she is awesome in this film. And then I was looking her up and she's like in a film with Margot Robbie soon. She's in a film with uh, like her next two films are giant films by like superb directors so she's boom like off and when you see her in this you'll understand why she's so good so i would say this is definitely a horror film but it's very light on the gore if you don't do horror like marie you're not a horror person at all right That's very we little gore last week <laughs> we established on our horror quiz special which david <laughs> forced us all to do yes <laughs> we have yeah so uh it's very light on the gore very light on the jump scares instead it's a really talky but in like kind of good way film you know once Grant has the girls in the house, he challenges their beliefs and just as they start challenging his. So, yeah, on paper, a two hour discussion about theology might not sound like something you really want to see yeah. in the cinema, but it's so superbly written and all three of the principal leads give great performances. And like I said, a special shout out to Chloe Eastwood Hansen in anything before. Easily one of the year's best horror films, but not really horror. I mean, it's it's a horror film, but would you say it's, it's kind very of low on a scale? Would you say it's more of a thriller then? Uh, just a lot of no, suspense. no, because no, because um, where the film goes eventually is horror territory. Okay, but okay. it's it's you know if you had to like say I don't know something like Terrifier is a ten out of ten on the gore horror scale, and this would probably be a two out of ten on the gore horror scale. It's there's really not much, you know, okay. kind of that kind of horror in it. It's more psychological and cerebral. It gets you thinking as you're watching it, awesome. and uh, there's some and uh, like again, there's a story Hugh Grant's tells in in the film that he goes and that when the, the writer and the director told him this story himself he's like that's actually what made me want to sign on for the film wow. and you'll know it when you see it that bit there's there's a brilliant bit in the film also you'll never be able to listen to radiohead's creep the same way again after this oh that's even better that's or hugh grant song. or hugh grant singing it 
Oh, disturbingly bad. Well, just disturbing. It's just disturbing. That's awesome. Um, I gotta watch this now. Okay, so now we are going to move on to our reviews. And Marie, first up, you're going to review a show that I had really very little interest in watching because I can't stand Danny Dyer. But also, it's a show that Disney Plus has made sure to remind everyone to update their passwords and content settings for because it is the soapy shag fest that is Julie Cooper's rivals. Yeah. Everyone sit back. The tea is scolding on this one. So, (laughs) (laughs) right. So, yeah, Rivals. So, yeah, as Neil mentioned, this is a Disney Plus show adapted by a novel of of the same name by Jilly Cooper. I did actually not know that until Neil pointed this out right before the um, uh, right before recording. Uh, the story is set in 1986, uh, following a rivalry between Posh Twat Number One, played by David Tennant, and Posh Twat Number Two, played by Alex Hassel. And currently, it stands at a 94% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes and a eight out of ten on IMDb. And my question is, did we watch the same TV show? Because <laughs> this was honestly god awful and i have generally a rule when it comes to tv that um if i'm not like if i don't like it after three episodes i'm out but because of the sake of the podcast and because these two were egging me on i stuck it out (laughs) and now i want those hours back because (laughs) i it was this is such a great example of great cast, great production, a semi-interesting plot because it's about TV and um, running a private TV network in the 80s, but a god-awful script. The script is just terrible. The characters don't have any chemistry with each other whatsoever. The motivations are unclear. And as <laughs> Neil mentioned, it is just there isn't a single episode without sex and the sex scenes can only be described as the word jackhammer. That's the type of like sex that's depicted here. And the show doesn't shy away from the fact that it's raunchy. The show opens up with two characters joining the Mile High Club in a very and very vocally, let's just say at that as well. <laughs> oh well, and it just yeah, just continues and I, I mean, my first ever appearance on this podcast was talking about the uh, uh, about the TV show Sex Education. I obviously don't mind sex in TV shows, but it has to serve a point and it has to contribute to the plot. And this just doesn't. There is just in one episode, there is just a montage of sex and it's just random characters. And you're like, we don't even care about these people. Why are you showing me their naked ass? Like, it's just doesn't like let up um i even like checked that if there was an intimacy coordinator on this shoot because the let's just say the sex scenes were extremely unoriginal it turns out there was an intimacy coordinator which is good for the modern era but um the choreography the yeah let's just say it wasn't there then it's then there is (laughs) the issue of just the main like there are several different swap swap plots on swap plots in this show and i mean the rivalry i mean they don't even say why these two characters are rivals it's just old money versus new money that's kind of the thing and it's just like well i hate you because you're a twat well i hate you because you're a bigger twat that's just it uh i'm sleeping with you because you're attractive i'm sleeping with you because i'm currently because my husband is having an affair and you're the only person there it's just nonsensical and then there is one like main love story like we're meant to be rooting for and it's just it's an enemies to lover story and i think i've mentioned this on this podcast before i eat that shit up i love enemies to lovers to the point as uh, point that i've seen a lot of enemies to lovers so i'm pretty much an expert in this genre uh, genre And for it to work, you need to have chemistry and clear motivations. And once again, it just isn't there. There. Like, her motivation is basically, he's such an entitled twat, but he has a big penis, so why not? His motivation (laughs) is, uh, I'm a bad boy, but she's an innocent flower. Uh, but and then her dad told me to stay away from her because there is a significant age difference. That's another thing. There's a 20-year age gap between these characters, and 
can we just not? Can we just move on from that? That it's just even though. Do you think the script tries to get away with it because it's set in the eighties? Yeah, but no, no. But like, no. <laughs> like with these, like you still need. I think these days tell stories in a modern lens, and it's just not okay anymore. Like like setting up a uh, setting up that to be the the main love story. And maybe it would have worked if they actually had chemistry, but they didn't and do not have it. And also it's just, they try to hit the same like enemies to lovers like beats where they meet and he's butt naked because of course, as you do, because everyone just plays tennis butt naked in their back garden. That's just it was a the common 80s. thing. thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, thing meet they instantly despise each other and then i think like at, that's the the thing with the script where i was just like okay does she genuinely hate him because there's no reason for her to be attracted to him like absolutely not not but no um and then there's the like whole arc where like she has a breakdown and then he picks her back up but again it's unjustified like when she like just starts crying i'm like oh girl pull it together it's not a big deal at this moment like it's n again not earned and then at the same uh, time her mother is constantly trying to fuck him as well it's just no it's oh my god <laughs> the subplots in this and then like when they finally get together uh get her it's just like again romantic musics but he's kind of dating someone else and it Ooh. and it kind of shows that he cares about this person and then they're like oh but they're not it's uh, like she's not you and he's not you it's just <laughs> so yeah i suffered a lot watching this i genuinely do not understand where the good reviews are coming from like as i said extremely cheesy extremely generic nothing original uh even david tennant doesn't save it and i'm a massive david tennant fan david tennant can play villain really really well as we've seen in jessica jones jessica jones yeah in this one he's oh, just so slimy but not no, it's unwatchable to the point. They also like really close shave him and he lost a lot of weight. So he also just looks really like stringy mm. and it's just not working. It's nothing about the show, in my opinion, works. And I really resent you guys for making me sit through this. <laughs> so, so, Marie, my question, my, my first question is, um, why is it popular then, do you think? I have no idea. It's like Will Farrell from a Zoolander. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills here. <laughs> I genuinely don't understand. Like the set design is good. The costuming is okay. The music is all right. I think even that with the music, I think they were trying to have their like Kate Bush running up their hill moment, like trying to really popularize one or like murder on the dance floor. Uh, floor salt burn moment where they really wanted to like have a viral song so they started like pushing all these 80s classics but it just doesn't really work well with the plot either it's i like so yeah if you've seen rivals and enjoyed rivals please let me know why because i generally cannot explain this <laughs> well marie i'll tell you i can ask my mum because she literally just finished watching it this afternoon I was like oh it's really good is there going to be a second series i was like i I will Google and find out for you. But I guess with the, um, I think she'd read the books though, like back oh, in like the okay. 80s. So I think she had like, you know, a link to the material and that. Um, so it's, it's not even good enough though to be just trashy fun. No, no, it's uncomfortable I was about to ask. fun. Like it's not even fun. It's just uncomfortable to watch. Like I do feel like, yeah, maybe moms of a certain age group might, <laughs> uh, might enjoy this. But. <laughs> uh like i don't know like watching this like from a modern lens and i yeah no and it breaks my heart if there will be a season two because um it takes david Tennant away from doing proper stuff again <laughs> i mean this is the spoiler free version but i don't think he will be in season two uh let's just leave it <laughs> <Okay>. at that <laughs> <laughs> oh. so just to clear up alex hassel and bella mclean are they that one main couple with I think the horrible so, yeah. storyline i'm looking at the cast right now mm -hmm. uh, and now jose's Rupert. gonna watch the show isn't he i mean i'm curious <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where he's like you gotta watch one episode just see how bad it is maybe i mean is it worth it <laughs> i mean it's up to you and maybe it's worth it to tell me if i'm not if I, it's like i'm the minor minority here who there absolutely hates it. all right jose it. you you can go and watch this in that one episode back. of rivals and i will let you know <laughs> Apparently, there is such a thing as too much penis in a show. Oh, well, I mean, I watched Euphoria, so I understand how that can go. <laughs> I, 
I have to give the show this, like the ratio of like female to male nudity is quite even, which I do appreciate because like usually female okay. nudity is like prevalent yeah. uh, more than male, but it's still, it's, it, I, I did not need to see it. I just, <laughs> neither. I, I'm fine with neither. It's just, it, 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 once again, it's just like, let's have the actors naked for the sake of being naked. It's just, it doesn't. Do you think they were doing that to compensate for the bad writing and whatnot? Maybe. Let's distract you with sex. And maybe maybe yeah. that's why. Uh, because coming from this, may, viewing this from an ace lens, maybe that's maybe that's why it's not appealing to me. <laughs> but um, but and I, if you look at like a show that did that exact kind of thing you was mentioning about, like you know the montage of everyone shagging, Sex Education literally opens its first ever episode with it. But it was funny at least, wasn't no, it? Well, yeah, Sex Education like oh opens like with just two people, and then they do the montage at the start of season four, three it. when we all know the characters. <laughs> Okay, well, that's um, uh, definitely a not recommend for Marie there. And Jose, <laughs> you're going to take another one for the team and see if she's crazy or yeah. actually completely justified in this. Uh, well, this just... reminds me of when we were we were talking, you were talking about a horror movie or something and you were saying, no, don't watch it. And we're all like, we kind of want to watch it now. Only because I made it sound so bad. That's why. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I forget what I mean, it was. The first remember... time, right. No, I don't. But the first time we ever asked for um, people on Twitter to tell us what film to watch, someone recommended Freddy Got Fingered. <laughs> now i love freddie got fingered but it is of its time very very of oh, its time so much and david who what he was like maybe 27 at the time watched it with his new new what like i think he only been married about a month at this point and they sat down and watched freddie got fingered and his wife literally got up and walked out after about 20 minutes i think he's like neil oh, man. we are never doing that again and then i found out it's one of my friends who uh, sent us a message saying oh what's freddie got fingered <laughs> of course Right, uh, so moving on. Cassie, you're going to tell us about Night Bitch. Yeah, sure. Um, I can kind of cheat on this one just because I did act, uh, have a review published. So I'm just going oh. to put <laughs> to remind myself. So um, I went to an early screening of Night Bitch in Chicago, uh, which was super cool because I don't get to do that very often. It's like a two hour drive from where I am. And you know, they're always like, well, maybe you don't know, but the press screenings are always like in the middle of a day and during the week. And I'm like, well, I have a job. <laughs> I was going to say a boring job. Um, I have a boring job. I can't go to these. <laughs> um, but there was one day that I was actually uh, had the day off work and it all worked out. So I was really excited because I got to see Night Bitch. Um, I believe it opens wide. Yeah. Uh, December 6th at least at least in America I'm not sure if it's yeah. different in like the UK or um other places in Europe but uh you know I like I didn't love it I didn't hate it I I I lean positive just because it is uh funny and different I know it's based on a book I haven't read the book um but Amy Adams is I mean she is just like full in um she's all in <laughs> in this movie what i found really interesting without you know trying to like give anything away was how little um the story is about the fact that she like thinks she's turning into a dog which is the the plot of the movie right like she like oh, there, there's so space, much else. sorry yeah oh do you not, <laughs> did you know? not know that's what a film was yeah. Jose? i didn't know yeah <laughs> So she's, I just saw the cast uh, list. she's a stay at home. She's a stay at home mother and she's <laughs> just a frazzled, exhausted, um, like mom who's like losing her entire identity and, and sense of self. And then she starts to literally physically like turn into a dog, <laughs> which is that's, that's out there. That's the part of the plot. That's not like a spoiler. Like that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. But there. that's only that's like a trailer. small part of the movie movie. So, <laughs> Yes, because there's just so much else going on. Okay. Um, like, and that's what was surprising to me watching it was I was like, did that was that even necessary? It's so dramatic, um, mm. as is. And uh, as someone who has been considering uh, having a child, it was uh, terrifying to watch because it's not it's not complimentary of what parenthood would be like <laughs> at all. Um, it's like really, really terrifying. It's also, um, so her husband is played by, uh, his name is Scoot McNary. Are you aware of who oh, this yeah. is? 
he's really good at playing like a wimpy husband. He, he was in the Speak No Evil remake. That's he it. Is, yeah, I was. I, I remember was like, him from um, uh, Halt and Catch Fire, that show. He okay. was like one of the main guys in that. I mean, he's really found his niche as like the the bitch ass husband who just kind of sucks. Um, <laughs> and he's really good at it. He's really. I see good him at on it. Google, and he's one of those guys like you don't know his name, but you recognize his face. Face, and apparently he's married to uh, that. So is her name Sosie Bacon, Kevin Bacon's daughter, which I just found out recently. Oh wow! And I was okay. like, that's random. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but yeah, right. he uh, he is. I mean, you really. You really feel Amy Adams' uh, frustration because he is really just a useless, useless human being who has no idea what she, as a mother, is going through. Um, and there is, you know, a, a, a bit of a redemption arc and all of that. Um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting movie. It's an interesting concept. I feel like it's supposed to be sort of empowering and it came off as a little silly as opposed to empowering. Um, that said, I did laugh. I was entertained. Um, so I think, you know, I think I gave it like 3.5 out of 5 on Letterboxd because I was feeling generous. But it's <laughs> it's different. It's interesting. <laughs> it's a little bit. Of, it like dips its toe into body horror just a little bit, but like maybe not quite enough. Like maybe it could have gone oh. farther, and but it kind of. It yeah. doesn't go full substance. No, no, not at all. <laughs> ah. Do you think, uh, as as someone else with maybe a family who who's going through what the character is going through, might see it a little differently? You know, people turning into dogs. No, yeah. the, having so, children well it's funny that you say that because i uh saw it i saw this movie with the same person i saw here with yesterday <laughs> and um he said that, that movie i think just made me realize why my wife left me <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. wow says, i swear to god that's what he said that's what he that's said that's your poster like, quote wow. right there isn't it he was like, <laughs> <laughs> here we go. Yeah, he was like, I, he was like, I'm going to talk about this with my therapist because, yeah, I wow. saw myself in that, that bitch ass husband. Like, he, he sucked and so did I. And I was like, good for you for, for recognizing wow. that, you know? <laughs> yeah. The only reason I asked that is because, um, I know random context here, but, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 is, is considered to be a great movie by a lot of people in general. And I like it, but um, I've heard of other people saying they love it so much because of the aspect of family, the the two sisters, and the whole father son dynamic. And um, I never thought about it, but I think certain movies, when they come at you at a certain angle, if you can relate to it through the characters for some reason, it definitely hits you more than if you're just a viewer that can't relate as much. So oh, yeah. I thought that was really interesting. For sure, for sure, and I think. It's supposed to be funny and relatable to people who have kids. I just found it like terrifying because um, I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> yes. Uh, do I want this? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and then my friend said, like, yeah, that was really painfully accurate. You know, like it's relatable. Wow. So I think it's it's connecting with those women who are literally in that position. And I think if you think how many, you know, the women are married, they've got kids, you know, like the useless husband. Again, I think it's it's really a warning to like be careful who you marry more than anything else. I think. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. uh, even more than uh, parenthood, it's it's a trip. It's it's a trip. It's a ride. It's a movie. <laughs> That's good. I, I think I'm definitely going to go and see it when it's out over here. I mean, being the UK, we're probably going to get like a dump of about ten. What well, do you think it's Oscar caliber? Because I know people were talking about Amy Adams potentially up for an Oscar for it beforehand. I could see her getting nominated for a Golden Globe. I I don't see nice. her getting nominated for an Oscar. That's just me. I fair enough. I don't know what I'm talking about, so I could be wrong. But <laughs> <laughs> that, my gut right now is no. Mm. I've recently finished uh, Skies and if you're in the States, Stars Sweet Pea, which is adapted by uh, Kirsty Swain from the book of the same name by C.K. Scoos, starring Fallout's Ella Pennell as the invisible, not literally Rhiannon. I can't. This is a funny thing. In the in the show, people can't keep pronouncing her name wrong, and I've literally done it in the intro. Rhiannon <laughs> Lewis, a quiet, bullied young woman who was pushed to her breaking point. Now, I briefly, I think me and Marie, we briefly talked about the first episode on a recent show, and I said it really has got a strong resemblance to the Irish show Obituary that's on Netflix as well at the minute. 
And that one starred Siobhan Cullen, who was great in Netflix's other Irish crime drama, Bodkin. And in that show, she played a character, brilliant name, Alvira Clancy. What a name. And she plays, she gets a job as an obituary writer at a small local newspaper. Then she gets demoted, uh, only getting paid per obituary. So, of course, she starts to kill people to keep her job and then obviously write the obituaries. Uh, also, there's a handsome new co-worker who comes in with an obvious will they, won't they? And then she tries to only kill bad people. So, this other show, Sweet Pea, shares so much with that show that I'm amazed people haven't just been like, have you just ripped this off and thrown more money at it? Because that's what it really feels like. Rhiannon, she works at a local newspaper as a receptionist, but she wants to be a reporter, and then she starts reporting on her crimes and move up the ladder. There's a handsome new co-worker who comes in with an obvious will they won't leave. But I would say at that point, I was a few episodes in, I was like, okay, this is just the same show, just not done as well. It's just missing the sharpness oh. of the script that obituary has. I think maybe the Irish setting just, it just, it, it, you know, it sears a bit more. Having said that, this show about around the midway point goes in a completely different direction. So I was kind of a bit more into it after that. And, you know, in the early episodes, we're really on side with Rhiannon. You know, we, we learn about her school bully, Julia Blenkinsop, how she terrorized her when they were kids. And uh, Rhiannon literally started tearing her own hair out and had to wear a wig when she was at school. That's how bad oh, wow. it got. Episode one literally starts with her saying, people I want to kill. And she's just like, it's a woman who's ignoring her in the um, supermarket. It's her boss who literally treats her as a human coat rack and throws his jacket over her in reception every walk through. And um, you, you think, okay, so it's going to be setting up this big showdown with her like high school bully. And it's really surprising me how that storyline develops and really well done to the writers when you kind of get to the midway point of the show for subverting the expectations of the genre and how I was expecting that to go. Now, Pernell, as we know from Yellow Jackets and Fallout, is really good, but I'd argue... This is her best on-screen performance because she's in pretty much every scene of the show. And it's a really tricky role to pull off because, yes, she needs to make you feel sorry for her, for, you know, all the bullying and shit life she's had. And, you know, you're almost cheering her on as she makes that first kill in the first episode because, you know, the first guy's a knob and he probably deserved it. Does he deserve to die that way? Maybe a bit too far, but you're kind of on side with her because she's been through so much shit. But then as she gets more confident and kind of, the confidence she gains from killing, like suddenly she's good at her job. Suddenly she's more attractive to people. Uh, suddenly she's much more confident at everything. And so it's a really kind of a tightrope you got to walk because you're like, is she actually getting too crazy to root for as the show comes on? You know, how is it going to go? Because she, certainly she's going to hit a point of no return where you can't come back from. I, I mean, arguably the end of the first episode, really, she can't come back from that. But um, yeah, as an audience, are we still on her side as the show goes on? Uh, there's some really good support in it as well. You've got Ted Lasso's Jeremy Swift, and he's like uh, the bumbling editor of the newspaper. Uh, you've got a guy called uh, Dustin Demi Burns, who I don't think I've seen in anything. He plays Jeff. Jeff's the obnoxious reporter. And from the first time you meet Jeff, you're like, you're going to be on the list, mate. You're, just, you're so going to be on the list. Uh, Nicole Leckie does great work as Rhiannon's, as Rhiannon's nemesis, Julia. And what could really be a one-note bully role, she injects so much more into her performance, and she really shines in the show's closing stages. I would say go and watch Obituary first if you haven't heard of it. Because like I say, it's a small little Irish show that uh, was made uh, in Ireland. On, it was put on RTE and then Netflix acquired it. And uh, the only way I discovered this was they had their show Bodkin, which was one about podcasters solving a crime in Ireland. And um, I thought, it's fine. It's a good show. It didn't blow me away. It didn't go perhaps as far as I thought it was going to go. I was expecting like a cross between The Wicker Man and Hot Fuzz. Uh, set in Ireland. That's what the trailer makes it look like. You're like, oh, this is going to be cool. Will Forte's in it as well. So you got, you know, you got the bumbling American offending all the Irish people. I was like, this is going to be really good. And I can't even remember how it ended because it just wasn't that interesting. But the lead actress in it was really good. And then when that show finished, you know, Netflix's algorithm showed me another show. I was like, is that the same actress? Wait, is it another Irish murder show? Okay, I'm going to watch it. And then I went through like a month of watching any Irish show where there was murders. And I think I cleared them all, to be fair. <laughs> yes. also let me recommend Kin with Charlie Cox in it because what a show and Aidan Gillen as well brilliant show it's like three seasons of the, three seasons of that now on uh, the iPlayer in the UK on BBC and take a breath Neil <laughs> Jose what would you like to talk about well uh, my my movie that I watched uh, it is it stars Brad Pitt and George Clooney and is not oh. an Ocean's Eleven sequel uh, <laughs> isn't it it is on Apple TV, one of my favorite channels now, or yes. streaming services, and it's called Wolf's, not Wolves, it's W-O-L-F-S, <laughs> and it took me a second. Not spelled this way, Jose. 
And that's spelled like Neil's t-shirt, Wolves of Glendale. So to give you an understanding of this, the, the title, it's, 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 I'm going to give you the shortest possible explanation. It's two guys who end up realizing they both do the same thing. They're technically lone wolves. So the title kind of plays on that. So it's uh, George Clooney and Brad Pitt play fixers for a mysterious group of people. And so the whole plot revolves around them fixing something that happens in a hotel room in the middle of the night. And it also involves Austin Abrams as the person that have to help get through the night. And it is it is definitely a slow burn. But it, I, one movie I would like to compare it to that it's kind of like a slow burn but totally different vibes is The Killer with Michael Fassbender from last Fassbender. year. Fassbender, okay. So that's obviously David Fincher. This is... John Watts, and I feel like those two directors really separate the kind of, you know, feelings you get. Like, this is more of a fun gang movie. Is it fun, though? Is it fun, Jose? I liked it. I, I, so getting a heads up from someone else I know said that it was not great. So I was like, okay, I see the trailer. I'm not expecting a lot. And I watched the the film because you've seen the trailer. I, I, yeah, I saw the trailer and. And I, I got to say, going into it, knowing it wasn't expected to be great and just kind of letting it happen, I really enjoyed it, actually. Oh. It kind of, it's kind of like a character piece on two older men realizing. I, I think one of the running gags that I enjoyed the most was the fact that they had bad backs and they both would like do something and be like, oh, oh, and then they just keep going. And I'm starting to relate to that as an older man. <laughs> <laughs> but. I, if, if there's one thing I could say to kind of really put it into context, if this was part of a, like a larger series like The Penguin, this would be a filler episode, honestly, because it's, it's like um, a hang movie. Then not it's not the stakes are fairly low. Yes, right? uh, you know, up until you get to the ending and realize what's going on, the ending is really interesting because you think it's going one way and then something happens, and then they realize stuff, and then there could or could not be a sequel. Yeah. Um, so it just, you know, it, even if it's, it's a standalone film and never gets a sequel, I think the way it ends is pretty interesting and it is a good take on making the whole movie something you can watch again. Maybe I wouldn't say you'd watch it like three or four times. I'd say you watch it once and then maybe and like, a, and maybe watch it one more time just to kind of be like, Oh, okay. I see what's going on, but it's not like anything you would watch multiple times. It's very much, so we, you, you see it and you, you enjoy it and you're done. Mate, so, despite um, your best attempts, I don't even think I'm going to watch it one time. If I'm no, honest. I mean, there's a lot better stuff on Apple. There's a lot of better stuff on Apple TV. Yeah, to be honest, it's not for everyone. It's if you like character pieces that are subtly funny, there's no real negativity negativity in it. So, what would you give a, it? Would you say it's a perfectly fine free star film, or would it be free stars pushing it? I'd say three and a half, honestly. And mm-hmm. you have to if you enjoy this kind of like because Brad Pitt and. and George Clooney have a great rapport, and I think that really carries the film. If you're a fan of them and you don't worry about having to have action a lot, like this has some good moments of action. It's just not a lot. But... I mean, I think that's what I kind of gathered from it. People mm-hmm. like basically it's George Clooney and Brad Pitt being George Clooney and Brad Pitt, and mm-hmm. they should have probably written a script to go along with that. <laughs> it was one of the, one of the negative reviews I saw. But, uh... Yeah, I mean, I, I can understand people who don't like it, and I I I say you know what if you didn't like it. I get it, but if if you think you'd like George Clooney and Brad Pitt enough to watch an entire film of them going and back and forth with some banter, I'd Being say old. check it out. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's definitely. I wouldn't say if you're under twenty five, you wouldn't like it. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think that's our listenership, Jose. I think we're uh, think we there. We go. We're safe. <laughs> yeah, but it's 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 a good just kind of maybe even put on. I don't know if you want to just put it on the background because you have to pay attention. But I'd say I like. I doubt. I doubt. I, I feel like I saw the trailer and I saw the film, mate. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> if I'm laid up in bed with like a and I can't walk anywhere, like I break my ankle or something, then I might watch it. If sometime. you have a day of being able to binge stuff, then I guess if yeah, I'm sick in bed, film. perhaps was a better way to say. Right, so. moving on to Marie from one of your worst subjects that you clearly didn't like at all to one of your favorite thing, which is vampires and gay vampires. Tell us all about <laughs> Interview with a Vampire. <laughs> Oh, yes. So, yeah, after the turd fest that was Rivals, I uh, needed, like, a palate 
cleanser. And unfortunately, I'm very limited with streaming opportunities uh, at this current moment, but this one was available to me on one of the sites that I have. And that was Interview with a Vampire. Now, I um, went into this story actually completely um, blind. I hadn't interacted with it before. I never saw the movie and I hadn't read the book book i i just knew the concept which is in the title it's an interview with a vampire <laughs> so um and i know there's like some changes from the original uh no sto- uh, original book and the movie so this version takes place in modern times it takes place during 2022 a reporter gets flown out to dubai to conduct an interview with a vampire he met in 1970 san francisco Another in- interesting element to this is that they wrote COVID into the script, which I don't know about you guys, but I find it now so weird to see COVID as a plot point, having now lived through that. It's just uh, like, it's like, oh, yeah. The, wor- the worst thing I ever saw that was when the morning show tried doing it in the second season and they gave Jennifer Aniston COVID. I mean, they didn't give Jennifer Aniston COVID, sorry. Her character <laughs> got COVID. And then they decided to put it on TV. It so far for storytelling. I yeah. mean, you never know. Yeah. She's a producer, right? So, yeah. So, Sorry, carry on. Yeah, but then, the, but it adds this interesting element of mortality to the story because the whole world is going through something terrible, and then there's the immortal figure of a vampire observing this, literally in his like penthouse suite in the biggest skyscraper ever in the Dubai. Uh, bye. So the story uh, follows journalist Daniel Malloy, who interviews Louis and about his um, life as a vampire. What makes this so good is that, and it's said from the beginning that Louis is an unreliable narrator. You, um, like, you're getting, like, his story, but basically because either time, because it's been centuries, the story uh, takes place in, starts in 1920s New Orleans, um, and then um, moves up to, like, uh, and then, like, travels uh, through modern day, which some, like, jumps louis uh it's we were constantly reminded either because of the passage of time louis is not remembering these events correctly or at the same time there's a psychological element to it where louis doesn't want to actually admit to himself the actual tragedy of his life and what he's gone through and through so it is interesting and um because of course it's an interview the story is mostly told with narration which um i don't know if i've mentioned this on the podcast it is one of my least favorite like storytelling tools i think some people use narration as a crutch and it can lead to very unoriginal storytelling but uh here it works really well i think uh what adds to it is that the actor uh jacob anderson who plays louis has a very nice voice and uh is like the narration is very powerful and he can introduced so much sadness in his voice that it just has an impact and as Neil mentioned it is very queer um <laughs> queer because the story also follows um mainly follows Louis and Lestat uh Sat the vampire who turned him and I think this is like the first iteration where they're actually openly together like I know the movie was queer coded but it was never confirmed that they're uh, they were actual couple, which is kind of funny because like it's always like the looking back in history, you're like, oh, they were such good friends or they were roommates. And it's just like, <laughs> no, Duh. no, we all know what was <laughs> happening. Like, but and then there is like this link between vampirism and queerness and just um, so that's like it's not even just queer because the characters are queer. It's just also, there's a lot of queer themes like loneliness. There's this amazing like bit of dialogue. I think it's episode one or maybe two where Louis describes his journey of becoming a vampire. This is not a spoiler, by the way, but (laughs) But Louis describes his journey, become a vampire. And he's like, in one night I died. I came back to life. I committed murder and I came out of the closet. And the interviewer was, uh, Daniel is just like, you equivalent becoming a vampire to coming out of the closet. And he was just like, 
I was a gay man in 1920s New Orleans. Like, do you like, of course, that was like a big moment for me to acknowledge that I was queer, to acknowledge that I am attracted to the same sex. And of, and obviously, as someone who identifies as queer, that is like really uh, interesting. And also like, I resonated with that a lot. And it's, I knew going into this show that it had a cult following, but it wasn't very critically acclaimed. To, um, but as rivals prove it, critics know shit because this show honestly is phenomenal. And when I finished the first episode, I genuinely, I think, had a hangover where I was just like, holy shit, that was good. Like, <laughs> it's just the, like, not just the acting, the staging, the story, how they put it together. Um, they, uh, with some exceptions, they stay consistent with vampire physics which I do really appreciate. It's something that I like really like, like it's one of my pet peeves when someone plays a vampire and then lifts a person up like a dead body and you can see that they're struggling underneath their weight. And you're like, no, you're a vampire. You're super, super strong. You shouldn't be struggling or speed because vampires are super fast. And like, they just completely ignore that in some stories that drives me crazy as well. They do do their best to consistency. They'd use a lot of wire work to introduce the like ghostly movements of the vampires. There's like an amazing moment in episode one with Lestat where it, it's like very eerie and it's very good wire work. And it's even in just the background, which makes it so much more creepy, but it's just such a cool little moment where just like, oh yeah, he's a bad vampire. It's, <laughs> but honestly, I highly recommend Interview with a Vampire. And I, I watched season one and season two I know season three is in production, which I am actually honestly quite hesitant about because season one and season two were so solid. And if the story had ended there, I think it would have been like a good, like, like an amazing show. Um, but we'll see where season three goes. It's just like, well, I'm curious because I know there's more than one book, but a uh, book. So I'm curious to see and see where the story goes. But at the same time, I was like, ah, they should have just kept it at two because the final line was also so good. It was such a good moment, uh, mm. moment. So yeah, I highly recommend it. Um, do you think they originally planned for season two if they were to end if they weren't getting a season three? And then because I think you said about it not being critically reviewed, I think it's been quite well critically reviewed. It's just that. Uh, it took like a year to come over to England from when it came out in the States. So, you know, God knows when you got it in Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was just noticed it was very underneath the radar and not many people were talking about it. And um, I mean, it is like, I don't even know. I don't know which it because it's not produced for, by, by any of the big streaming channels. So I think that's like adds to it. But uh, I'm not sure like what their plan was because i don't know i think they wrapped everything up nicely in a bow but there might be some like unanswered questions one thing that what they did like really good with season one and season two because louis is such an unreliable narrator like we see scenes in season one and then we see them in a different context in season two and you're like okay which one was the real one and they do that throughout and i think that's like mm. really interesting where it's like one of those things where you have to really pay attention to like what's happening and like is going okay like who's who's telling the story here and there are also like some really interesting twists that happen like season one ends on a pretty like big uh interesting twist and it it's it's again a solid ending for uh for the final season but that season one like ends with like there is going to be a season two like it wasn't all wrapped up uh to mm. well whereas season two does feel like it's more wrapped up in a bow here's a question for me do you think you're a little hesitant to watch the movie with brad pitt and tom cruise if i think you would just make Marie angry now <laughs> <clears throat> well i mean i wonder how much of because the that movie is based off the original book because there are other books that yeah, but so is this series is based off the first one as well, I believe. But how much of the book is covered in each season? See, That's I don't know because like I haven't read, read the book, book either. And I, to be honest, I, I'm not hesitant to check out the movie. It's just something that I've never... I, I don't like Tom Cruise, so that's why I don't think I ever watched the movie. Fair. Fair. Um, and I'd say uh, that's probably one of his best roles, though, honestly. Yeah, oh, I, I, mean, I, was, I was like surprised when I checked the cast list uh, to see that uh, Tom Cruise actually played Lestat. I thought uh, Brad Pitt was Lestat, but he was Louis, yeah. um, uh, yeah. which uh, like kind of shifted the characters in mind. I yeah, it's just never appealed to me. I don't know. 
Um, okay. I think just just wait for season three. <laughs> yeah. No, I no, I'm saying just in like maybe not right now, but maybe if if season three is the ending, or just if you find out, I because I haven't, I didn't even know about the series, but I'm a big fan of the the movie, and it's been a while, and to have the idea of like, oh, they were a couple, I'm like, boo, obviously duh, but like also mind blown. <laughs> Sorry. It was a, it was a, it was a, it was a simpler time for Jose when you watched the original <laughs> film, wasn't it? Yeah, I was just like, oh yeah, that makes sense now. Why why didn't it come across that idea before? Because uh, you're right. It's like because a lot of those movies, like it's like watching a movie as a kid. You just take it at face value, and then you watch movies when you're an adult. You're like, oh, that was a dirty joke. Right. You know? Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of nuance that you don't really that doesn't mm -hmm. register. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. but I. I am curious to, to now I want to watch this show as well. well there you I go. Jose, you got two seasons. It, and I think you would enjoy it. There's also quite quite a, like, I mean, maybe not in the level of you guys because you actually watch horror movies, but there is actually quite a lot of gore and horror elements in there. It's one mm. of the main reasons I'm not going to be recommending this to my mom because I know she couldn't be able to deal <laughs> with those scenes. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it does, like, doesn't shy away from the fact that they're vampires. And I think it does also introduce some cool elements to, of vampire lore into the story. They're, the effect of, like, when they step out as step into the sun is really cool. And I think that's really original, where, like, when Ooh. they're exposed to the sun, it honestly looks like, like, the ash is, like, falling off them, them like, sand. It's, like, this really cool effect where oh, it's, like, ah. Oh. Wow. I don't think I've ever seen it done. I think vampire effects have probably come on a long way since the days of Angel and Buffy. <laughs> you know, is it oh, sad they that they were pretty solid back then as they well? They were solid, but is yeah. it sad for like a split second? I was thinking Twilight glowing skin. Yeah, I was. And I like, thought yeah, of, yeah, I thought no, of they don't sparkle. Rob Pattinson was, was <laughs> weird. Yeah. My brain went. And then I'm like, oh wait, they burn up in that world. Yep. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of horror, I'm going to segue from interview the vampire back to you, Cassie, and you're going to be telling us about Smile too. Yeah, which I feel like it's such old news now. It's been out for like <laughs> forever now. Like, like when we first talked, I was like, oh, I just saw Smile 2 yesterday. I'll talk about Smile 2. And now like everyone's seen it, but that's fine. <laughs> we can still talk just came it. out in Portugal. We got everything okay. extremely late. <laughs> yeah. So um, well, have you guys seen the original? Have you seen Smile? Yes. Thing? You have. Okay. No, I've Did seen a spoiler see review. I don't watch horror. So, but I know. No oh, you don't, oh, yeah. On. You said that. You said that. I, okay. I've seen the synopsis and I accidentally saw a clip of something happening in the end of the movie, I think. And that's about How it. Do you no, I don't I believe, no. accidentally saw a clip of something you, happening. YouTube stuff, <laughs> you know, like movie stuff, you know? Yeah. And I was like, oh man, now I kind of know the ending. So Was it a video that said, you'll never guess what happened at the end of Smile, Jose? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's honestly kind of like a visual effects stuff. So that's why okay. I was... I was like, oh, oh, okay. So, I don't want to give it yeah. away. Uh, well, speaking of, yeah, like like visual effects. Um, so there is sort of, there, there's an opening scene that's really disconnected from the rest of the movie. Again, I will not spoil. Um, but it is used to wrap up sort of stuff that happened in the, the first movie, right? Which a lot of the times you have to do whenever there's a sequel to a horror movie, right? <laughs> um, and... That scene is one of the coolest um, shot scenes I've seen in such a long time. And there's a, a shot where Kyle Gellner's character, Joel, runs and jumps through uh, the window of a house and then runs through the... Uh, they actually played part of it in the trailer. He literally gets like hit by a truck in the trailer. So <laughs> oh. that's not a spoiler. Um, but yeah, so he runs, jumps through the window, runs through the yard and into the street, and then it just goes wide on the house. And it's just the coolest shot ever. And, um, you know, because of movies like here, where everything is fake and green screened, I guess I just assumed that there was some like fakery involved because it just looks so cool. And I... And I messaged um, someone that I know that's involved in the the making of it, and and he was like, no, um, you know, they had a, a camera a attached to a crane, and and it was uh, hoisted onto one of those mini cars, and like he jumped through the window, and then and then the car drove and went well, and it was all it was practical, and which wow. makes it even cooler. I know it was it was it, I was like I don't know why I didn't think of that because it, for some reason you just assume everything is. <laughs> his face yeah. these days but it wasn't so yeah the, the first scene alone 
almost could could be like a I don't know like a short short horror film um of of its own uh it did suffer from a little bit of that uh dialogue uh that you know syndrome where they're they're making it really obvious that they're trying to remind people of of what is happening because of what happened in the last movie right like they're kind of over explaining as it's happening hmm. um which it's like they, would this person really say this right now <laughs> it's just like, like, like oh do you we remember, remember what just happened to us two days ago but right exactly <laughs> very over explaining in the heat of the moment it's like i don't think you would be saying this right now um so it suffered from a little bit of that um but still a, a very very cool opening scene and then the rest of the movie tr honestly could function as its own movie like and not even be a sequel and you wouldn't even know really um which is interesting to me um it, it's really i think that's one of the reasons that it's it's really good and it has been really well received as it's really very much its own thing it's very i mean there's a musical you know oh. what the, that movie trap lady raven it's like another pop star <laughs> tortured <laughs> suffering pop star um yeah the the main character she's like a pop singer she's this uh famous singer um and it's very trippy very uh kind of like marie you were talking about unreliable narrator but the narrator is like the camera like it's the movie itself like you know you don't know what is what is happening like you you don't know what's what's real and what's not and you don't know like like what to trust what to believe uh which is fun so it really has a psychological aspect to it like a psychological thriller aspect which i love um Naomi Naomi Scott's performance is like she is so locked in that's what the kids say right locked in she's so locked in <laughs> <laughs> like wrong crowd to ask right? phenomenally locked in just trust me yeah Did she um eat? Did she... yeah she eats oh, yeah her performance eight uh <laughs> um it's oh. just it's it's creepy it's weird it's very uh trippy at times you see there's a cameo from jack nicholson's son who looks just like jack nicholson it's really oh, weird wow. yeah that's cool <laughs> um, I didn't... a lot of really good acting it's just um it's hmm. just it's entertaining it it flies by it's a, kind of a, it's over two hours but it doesn't feel like it's over two hours and then well uh i went i just went for fun i didn't go as like uh i wasn't reviewing it or anything like that um i just wanted to see it and at my screening they <laughs> like you know the last 60 seconds of pretty much every horror movie something insane always happens right before the credits roll and they turn the lights on a minute before the movie <gasps> was over no. I'm not kidding. i almost wanted to, i was like should i ask for my money back i was like should i be <laughs> about this because you really you just went to everything <laughs> so oh, apart from that experience which has nothing to do with the movie itself <laughs> um yeah that's that's a smile too it's a really it's a really solid solid sequel it's fun i mean I, I just missed it because there was so much out at the time time yeah and that was i just didn't get a chance to, i forget what i saw because i got one of these um city well cards in the uk so like you pay like i don't know it's like 180 quid a year and you can pretty much go to cinema whenever you want and see whatever you want at the cinema mm -hmm. as many times although they do have a little you can't book more than 10 films in a row now as i found out with like all the uh <laughs> unlimited screenings coming up and that and what's some cool weirdos we're, we're just trying to live there probably oh, <laughs> neil is that weirdo <laughs> yeah they're like you cannot watch four movies a day sir <laughs> every day <laughs> he has a well, just just <laughs> definitely did free back to back on a day a couple of times definitely done three <laughs> now but would you that say was that... back to the future day sorry go ahead wow. would you say that that the movie gets a nice financial and therefore visual bump because of the success of the first one oh for for sure i mean there's very clearly um a bigger budget which a lot, a lot of the time i think they will use as an excuse to sort of slack off and make the story not as good right but i i, re mm -hmm. I really think it yeah they did they did good things with it and i think making it so completely different than the first the first smile movie really really worked uh the budget for this was only like 28 million which, Only, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Only. Like, wow. like, it's probably like double what the first one was. But yeah. again, that's, yeah. that's why horror films are always massively successful because they don't cost a lot and they make an absolute ton. And this just took yeah. almost 110 million already. 
and it's probably still and, on wow. ground. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, the the story, the plot itself doesn't necessarily reinvent the wheel. Like like the first Smile movie was an allegory for trauma. Like what? Like every every horror movie is an allegory <laughs> for trauma, right? And yeah. and it it kind of is along that same vein, but there's a there's an element of the impact on social media and everyone having a smartphone at all times that sort of mm -hmm. is just making it so much worse. Um and how mental health is is impacted that way. So it's it's cool. It's smart. It's timely. And yeah, yeah. You know, nice. I'm I'm curious. Have you seen movies in integrate smartphones more, like in a in a, in a way that makes sense? You think? Because I remember with horror movies, back in the day, to help with the plot, they'd be like out in the middle of nowhere with no cell reception. That's why they couldn't call the police. Uh, right. did, did do you think that some of the movies now, more specifically horror movies, are getting smart about the whole cell phone situation? Yeah, well, you know, I always say it's one of the reasons that I mean, we're not talking about sitcoms, but it's one of the reasons sitcoms don't work anymore was because the foundation of like sitcoms was always based on miscommunications and people mm, not being able yeah. to, to communicate with each other. Right. And well, he said this or that. And but I don't know where he is. And we know where everyone <laughs> is at all times now because we just text them. Right. So that's yeah, just like not yeah. a thing anymore. It just doesn't happen. So you're right. You need to be smarter about that kind of a thing when you're when you're thinking up the story like this. Although not horror films, Ray. Actually, there's um, one of the best sitcoms on at the minute. It's an Australian one called Colin from Accounts. It's such a good show. I and, didn't uh, and catch that. Jose, it's like, yeah, it's it's the best. Uh, calling it a rom-com almost is a disservice because it's so sharply <laughs> written. It's so good. And I love that the two characters in it, they're not like stereotypes, you know. They're one one's, uh, one's like a junior nurse. The other one owns his own like brewery. There's a bit of an age difference in the thing. Uh, we've talked about it a little bit before. But in uh, season two, there's an episode where um, he's doing a big meal. He's like, oh, I'm going to do a nice like, meal. I'm going to cook, spend all day cooking a meal for his uh, girlfriend. And she's coming home from work and she falls asleep on the train. And someone nicks her bag that has her phone in it. And oh. she ends up in this, like an hour away from where she needs to be with no mobile phone. And then it almost becomes like a version of Scorsese's After Hours, where in like, but in a half an hour sitcom where she's, you know, she, she sees two girls. Can you get me an Uber? Oh, no, my mum said not to talk to strangers. And they keep walking. <laughs> <laughs> like like that. Like she goes into a restaurant and like tries to run out without paying, so they'll call the police on her, and they don't. They just feel sorry for her. So, well, can you use a phone? <laughs> oh, no, it's customers only. And then they chuck her out. It's like right. things like that. Yeah. And oh. they keep each other on the way. But it just shows you, like, not having a mobile phone. It almost happened to me. I went up to a, a, a show at Wembley in the summer, and my, my uh, power bank stopped working. So I was like, okay, I need to be really careful with like taking pictures and videos, because uh, I still need to get an Uber back to wherever the home my how my hotel is afterwards. And I was down at like five percent, and of course, there's no cell reception near Wembley. There's no internet reception near Wembley after it kicks out. And I, I I walked for about an hour and a half, and just to risk turning my phone on to somewhere I could get an Uber, because I'm thinking, I've got how do I get home without my <laughs> phone at the minute? It was crazy. Yeah. 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 Another risk with cell phones is now is we don't um, we don't memorize people's phone numbers anymore. So you don't oh, have your phone. Yeah. You don't know who to call, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, oh, like certain scenarios where you get arrested and you're like, you get one phone call, and I'm like, right. Oh. How I don't the fuck know. I'm, like I don't think I'm planning on getting arrested anytime soon. But still, it's just like in those scenarios, <laughs> where it's just like, oh, I would yeah. be screwed. No, I don't know any of my friends' phone numbers. I just have them saved in my phone. Like, yeah. you know. But also, we don't even call people anymore. It's all over. Right, like, <laughs> you just text. Right, I know. Center. So true. It's, it's like so true. Random number. I'm not picking this up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. Well, this br this brings us on to uh, one of the last things we're going to talk about today, and that is the franchise. So, from John Brown, Armando Inucci, and Sam Mendes comes another satirical comedy, and this time, instead of taking its aim at politics like they did in Veep, the thick of it, in the loop, shows like that. This one is going to take the piss out of movie studios and, in particular, superhero films. So this show is a behind-the-scenes look at a superhero film called Tecto, Eye of the Storm, which only exists because it's a tiny mid-budget film for the, large, the much larger Reed Avengers team-up film called Centurious 2. Now, this show has such an amazing cast, and it's primarily told from the point of view of Himesh Patel's character, Daniel Kumar, an overworked, stressed-out first assistant director whose job it just seems to be permanent firefighting and reassuring all the fragile egos on set of the other workers, the other talent, just to keep the film moving, and hopefully they all keep their jobs. 
Um, you've got Stormfront from the boys, Aya Cash here, yes. not being an artsy this time, but she plays Anita, an ambitious new producer on the film, and she just sees it as like a stepping stone to doing more prestige work. You've got a uh, local talent to where I live, Jessica Hines from Spaced, She's in it playing a script supervisor who staunchly backs up every word from our German director, Eric Pichard, which doesn't sound very German, but he's definitely German because <laughs> he's played by someone Marie knows from when you were much younger, Daniel Brühl. I'm always so happy when I see him doing well in Hollywood. I'm like, oh, because I know him from like being a child actor. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, we will get into your story of going to Colin Farrell's acting academy someday in a later episode, Marie. We will definitely... Oh, I'm surprised you remember <laughs> that. <laughs> But yeah, crank right. up the metameter. It means Baron Zemo is making a superhero film in this one. You've got Lolly Adafope, probably best known for the UK Ghost Show. She plays Dag, and she's uh, a new third assistant director. And she's just a sarcasm. She she is the sarcasm of the show. She's just everyone's so afraid to not say the wrong thing on the film set, and she's just got no filter. She'll just absolutely say what the audience is thinking, or like the worst possible thing to say at any point. Uh, I reckon she'll be running the studio by the end of the series. That's how it's going. Because she just she's like failing upward with every insult she like says out to people. However, my favorite double act of the whole show is the film's insecure lead actor, Adam. And he's played by Billy Magnuson, who hasn't done a lot, but you might remember he was the he was like the really crap baddie in the new version of Roadhouse. He was like the the bang guy's r- rubbish son. But the undoubted MVP of the show is Richard E. Grant's Peter Fairchild, a seasoned British thespian who openly detests everything about the film he's making and all his co-workers. He's foul-mouthed and every line out of his mouth is pure comedy gold. I mean, just in the first episode, they leave him in front of um, the lights too long and they burn his eyeballs. And they go, 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 he's gone blind. Has he gone blind? Well, I can't fucking... And then he just says, you flashbanged my eyeballs, you spineless fuckhead. <laughs> That's just a standard line, you know. Honestly, imagine a swearier Alan Rickman from Galaxy Quest and you're halfway there to how brutally horrific Grant is in this. And actually, it's funny, doing an interview, this comes back to my Hugh Grant story from earlier. I remembered it, yay. Um, <laughs> uh, so Richard E. Grant was doing an interview about what it's like in the film industry and he like saying how like you know the films only really get made because of like the runners and that. And he goes, when my daughter started in the industry, she started as a runner. And one actor who will remain nameless was an absolute dipshit to her so much so that she basically just didn't want to do it anymore Mm. and of course everyone looks her up on the imdb what films did she work on oh she worked on these three films oh all with the same actor that actor was hugh grant so i'm not saying it was Mm. hugh grant but being an internet detective but it was hugh grant yeah it was hugh grant Grant. yeah (laughs) i i do work in uh in the office i work in we do have some people who work in the industry in different jobs and uh one guy was just like yeah, I know people who know people, and he is not a nice person in real life. Uh, so we're probably never going to get Hugh Grant on here, but um, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. Um, I love how later on in the show as well, they introduce Catherine Watson's character, and she's a brilliant actress, she's always really underrated. But her character is just a direct attack on Brie Larson and the toxicity that surrounds her and the Captain oh, Marvel and wow. all the basement dwelling bedwetters elements of toxic fandom. You know, when you can't have a strong, powerful female in a superhero movie now, because apparently men can't handle it for some reason. And her character is literally just there to do that. Like, you know, she's like, I'm just about to rap. I just want to go home. And they're like, yeah, we're making your role bigger and we're giving you a special power stick. And then, of course, the actor's like, but that's bigger than my invisible hammer. And, like, that's the kind of stupid shit they're having to deal with. And, like, these conversations that people are trying to defuse on a daily basis. And um, I've really enjoyed this show so far. I think we're, like, four episodes in. But I think I've I've spoken to a few people and quite – I I seem to be more up on it than quite a few other people. There's a guy in my office, like I say, who's uh, works in the industry, and he's just – I don't find it funny. It's not funny. And uh, Jose, counterpoint. Yes, it is not funny. No, <laughs> no so I, I, I'll give you this. The writing is smart. It's clean. It's sharp. And mm-hmm. I can see where they're trying to be funny. I think it's just not, I mean, not in that group. I think this is made for people who have worked on sets, who've worked with people like this. Again, I think it's one of those things where if you relate to it, it's funnier than it really is. Because as a, a viewer, like I'm a fan of Marvel and this is obviously skewering Marvel. <laughs> And I, I get what they're and doing. DC, a, I think. And DC. Oh, definitely. Both Marvel and DC. And there was even a, a moment, like a, just a moment in the early first episode where they're just doing this really great long take. And like the they were like, hey, we need to do this. Can we do it in visual effects? And then they ask a really tired looking man, can you do this in post? 
and he's like uh, i forget what he even said but i just thought okay they're they're trying to make a joke about visual effects people being overworked but then they kind of just blew it off after that and um i i think that there is a, so much potential and i've only seen two episodes i'm gonna finish it even though i don't like it just for marie's sake because she took one for the team before <laughs> but i i do think that there is so much potential for the show because at the end of the first episode the the main character tells this story well this a is a running thing on at the end of every episode isn't it you know I didn't really pay attention to the end of the second episode. Yeah, so, so I know, I know what you're going to say, mate. So, yeah, at the end of every episode, where the credits are rolling, they have, like, the EP, EP, G, EPG, electronic press kit interview. So there are all these, like, little <laughs> interviews that the cast always have to do to promote the film and, like, be super positive about it. And there's usually Richard E. Grant not doing that and just being... I mean, he's, he's goes on about a monkey beating someone to death on a set at some point, or did he beat the <laughs> monkey to death? It gets very dark. It gets very no, dark. No, Richard E. Grant is it. great about being a horrible older man with very different stories, but that wasn't what I was going to talk about, Neil. It's the oh. story of the circus performer, who the guy who cleans up the elephant crap. at the And so that story, it showed like a really good moment of realizing, okay, there is some heart to this the show. And uh, I don't want to give away the story because I, I obviously will not do it justice. But um, I, I I feel like the, there there is a lot of potential, and I want to give Billy Magnuson, uh, the guy who plays the superhero, some credit because he's he's a great character actor. He was in Roadhouse, but he's also in um, Game Night, which I thought was a oh, great yeah, underrated yeah. movie. And what's the the TV show Made for Love with Kristen Milioti? Oh, and yeah. I he, have, he played the husband in that, didn't he? He played the tech billionaire husband, and I I've heard great things. It's on my watch list. I need to I need to get on that because I I've seen Kristen Milioti get a lot of praise for that show as well, and so it, it's just I feel like that guy is is getting his uh his time coming you know I think he's gonna blow up soon if because I uh, I just every time I see him even in stuff like this where he's not really blowing up on the sh on the on the show but I feel like you could just see he's he's meant for more um maybe not as a good guy. I don't think he's a good guy kind of actor. He was pretty good as the bad guy, but there's. Some, I think he's more of a character actor. He, that has he, a lot I of think potential. he's he could he could corner the market on loser husbands again pretty well. Actually, I think <laughs> he's, yeah, he's got but, that vibe, hasn't he? Yeah, but I think I th if anything though, this show is is really well written. I can't deny that. I just, well, it's I the think... people who did Veep, man. Like Veep. Yeah. I think, but I, I think you're right in one thing there, Jose. Well. Maybe more than one thing, but I think it's <laughs> yeah. I think if you work in the industry, you relate to it so much more. I mean, like you say, my day job, I'm a video editor, and I'm just like, and someone's like, oh yeah, can you just like change everything you've done in like two minutes? <laughs> oh yeah, sure. You no, know, that's only yeah. only spent three days working on it. You know, of course we can just absolutely change everything last minute. And then someone will nod and say, oh great, and you're like, no, it's being sarcastic. <laughs> yeah, and another th thing that kind of puts it in perspective is this other movie that was very similar called The Bubble. Which I don't think it did nearly as well of a job doing. I didn't mind what... it. I mean, it was fine. I, again, it, I I didn't enjoy that movie either because I was like, this is too close to home for people who are in the business. I see what they're doing, but it I was mean, he's so catchy. Wake up, though, because I know I've only seen bubble. the scenes with Pedro, <laughs> but I know he's in it. <laughs> I did not expect his scenes with Daisy Ridley in it either. I did not see that coming. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think this is a better, better written show. So I think that that really. It seems like you're changing. You're having a reverse ferret on it, Jose. You're now. Oh, okay. Now it's, you're you're you're. Uh, giving I, it I see the potential. I'm not saying I I had a great time with the first two episodes, but again, I feel like it's going to get better. By the way, you. I look forward it. to it every episode yeah. each week. I, I check when is yeah. it was on in a minute. Okay, well, I think that about rounds us off today. I think we're. Uh come to the end of our time here today on the We Need a Rose podcast. I'd like to thank our first time guest, Cassandra. Uh, it's been great Yay. having you here today. And oh, where thanks. can people find you on the socials? Um, on Twitter 24-7. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> just look no, for I'm, me, Pedro um, Pascal posts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, just search his name and my stuff will pop up, I think. Um, so I'm at The Movie Mermaid is my Twitter handle. And then I oh. am at The Movie Mermaid is my Instagram as well. Um, and then my pinned um, link is, or my pinned tweet post whatever they're calling them now um has a link to like the websites that i've written for and stuff like that so you know my emails in there if you want to like email nice things to me whatever <laughs> or it oh. Pedro but, yeah. number you know exactly <laughs> <laughs> 
exactly so yeah tw i'm yeah i'm constantly posting like my thoughts on movies and reviews and stuff like that on on twitter so that's where you're most likely to find me <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Uh, I'd like to thank Marie, who has now let us know there is definitely a thing as too much penis in the show this uh, episode. <laughs> and uh, whether you and people, where um, where can people find you on the socials so they can agree or disagree with you, Marie? Uh, you can find me under the handle Life on Mars. That is TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, and um, I do not interview vampires. However, if you want to know how to achieve mortality, because climate change will kill you, you can find uh, and you can check out my podcast, Two Girls, One Reusable Cup, which is all about living a low waste lifestyle in your 20s. And that's wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, Jose, I'd like to thank you for your service of watching yet another underwhelming stream streaming film. And where can people find you? <laughs> if you want to look at my portraiture, uh, you can find me on Instagram at, at Jose Lopez Photos. If you want wedding photography, go look at jlopezphotos.com. Now, Jose, <laughs> just to clarify for the listeners, JLo Photos, there are no pictures of JLo on there that you have taken or pictures of any of her weddings. No, none of her weddings, no paparazzi. I'm not Yet. sure if I want to do her weddings now because that might be cursed. But yeah. uh, <laughs> but you but would just get a lot regular... of business out of it. You but get to meet Ben Affleck for a years. third time. You'd be a go, repeat yeah. customer for sure. <laughs> yes, she'd get the, the punch. She'd probably get a free wedding at this point. Yeah. Why two get one free? Yeah. There you go. Right, and I'm off to apply for video editing jobs. As from tomorrow, as this is recorded, I am technically unemployed. So if you need a video editor, podcast producer, videographer, or a film TV nerd guest on your podcast, hit me up because I basically have the time for the next couple of months until I'm hopefully back in work again. So drop me a DM on Twitter, and I'm at Needed Roads because I forgot the we. We'll see you next time, folks. We Needed Roads.